how many of you have ever in your lives had the task of trying to plan a huge party of the scale of like a wedding or something like that? And a couple people, all right. A couple parties on that scale, probably even here in our, uh, in our lifetime. How do you decide who you're going to invite to your party? Oh, it's the trickiest thing, isn't it? Take it even one step further when you're planning out a wedding, trying to come up with the seating arrangement, the most stressful part of planning such a party. With our, our wedding a couple of years ago, four, <laughs> earned my brownie points there. We had, we had a pretty big wedding. We were a little over 200 people at ours. And we had come up with the dreaded lists, the A list, the B list, the C list, trying to decide how we're going to figure out who we can uh, bring to the party. Mainly, you know, because unfortunately, when you're on a budget, you can't just bring everybody. Yet, the must-haves that definitely like, and if we have room and money, the A's, B's, and C's. And the A-list invites for kind of all the, the, the VIPs, the, like I said, the must-haves. They may not have gotten the red carpet at the Oscars kind of entrance to our reception. But there are many people who would not even have wanted something like that. But that desire to belong, that desire to be included, is just a part of who we are as human beings. That's part of our human nature. As one psychologist actually quantified, you may have seen this this thing, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. This is not me trying to uh, defend Maslow or whatnot. You can think what you want of him. But some of the ideas at least make sense. Uh, the idea of belonging was right about here in the middle. Once we know we've got food and oxygen, once we know we're safe, uh, and we're not trying to defend ourselves from that, one of the next things Maslow had said we wanted is that feeling of belonging, that feeling of connectedness. As we move up that hierarchy, that triangle, being accepted, belonging, is something that we start to seek out. It's not a New York thing or a U.S. thing to want to belong, to want to be interconnected. It's not a rich or a poor thing. It's a human thing. We are a social creation. We don't want to be auto-dumped into that C-list that if we have room and money, you can be invited. So where on that list, the A-listers, the B-listers, and the C-listers, do we fit? Let's pray. Lord, open our minds, our ears, and our hearts to hear your word. To not just hear it, but to be transformed by it. Amen. The passage for today comes out of Moses' writing, Deuteronomy 10. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You also should love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. Him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God. 
who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So what does the Lord require of you? You may very well have heard this phrase before, though maybe not out of Deuteronomy time. Maybe even out of one of the songs we've sung a couple of times, or if you've been at camp. You may have heard it from this passage, more as it's more commonly known or recognized. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Interesting quote. To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a bottom line kind of verse. It's a give it to me straight, no frills, just tell me what's up. Like the rich man in Mark 10 who asked Jesus, what is it that I must do to inherit eternal life? Just tell it to me straight. I got 30 seconds before I got to be off to my next business meeting. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Boil it down for me. And Micah gives us the three things. Or three things. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Moses kind of does the same thing in this passage that we read from Deuteronomy. Boiling it down a little bit, only with five things. Fear the Lord, walk in all his ways, love him, serve the Lord, keep the commandments of the Lord. Boiled down, no frills. My Bible actually has this section headed, the essence of the law. The law can be a bit tricky to read, especially when you get into Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In my opinion, Deuteronomy is the easiest. And this boils all of those down in a couple of points. It can take a lifetime to be able to try and accomplish. All of these are ways we respond to God's love. So love throughout Scripture isn't about a feeling, isn't about the sweaty palms or the rapid heartbeat or the mushy feeling inside. But it's a verb, something we do. When we read about, when Paul writes to the church at Rome about God showing his love, he doesn't say God had the mushy feelings in his heart and so he offered Christ on the cross while we were still sinners. He doesn't say God had the rapid heartbeat, so he offered Christ on the cross, even though we were still sinners. But he says God demonstrated his love in this, that he offered Christ while we were still sinners. So how do we demonstrate our love for God? Well, these three things. As Moses' version of boiling it down, fear the Lord, walk in his ways, love him, serve the Lord, keep the commandments. Ironically enough, there it shows up, this idea, boiled down, shows up in the New Testament as well. As Jesus, as it's boiled down. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Commonly known from the New Testament as the golden rule. It's offered here in Luke and then in other places throughout the Gospel. Ironically enough, this verse, Luke 10, 27, said as Jesus does, is not a quote from Jesus. He wasn't the one who said it. But we'll get there. Hang on to that. Teachers are often known for something have something that, about their personality or their teaching style that makes them stand out. The teacher, his name eludes me at the moment, from 
dead poet society would be the one who stands out by making the students stand up on a desk. Rich, you don't remember his name either? Being a teacher, I thought she would be a good one to go to. <laughs> I had one teacher in the fourth grade who, even though it was 25 years ago, her thing still stands out to me because she claimed it and, and wore it proud. She was famous for asking why. Fitting that she was a fourth grade teacher because right about that point was when we could finally start answering that question. But we might read that the passage we read today and ask, why should I fear, obey, love the Lord? Why? Maybe she was prophetic, my teacher. Because today we don't live in a take it at face value kind of society. I won't even make you ask the why. I'll just give you the reasons. Reason one, probably of many, but I will boil this down to three. Reason one, out of recognition for who God is. As Moses says straight up in verse 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty, awesome, and the titles could keep going on and on and on. The descriptors can keep going on and on and on. If there ever was one, Moses was the man of the Old Testament. And even he couldn't have survived being able to see, just see God physically. That's when he made the request, God had said, you know what, Moses, that's the one thing I can't give you to let you see my face. And Moses, the hero of the Israelite nation, got put into a rock, and as God flew by, he could just see the end of his, the end of it, the tail end. He could just see that little bit of a God who commands this kind of description out of verse 17, being the God of gods, Lord of lords, great God, mighty, awesome, and as I said, could continue on and on. Could only see the tail end of a God who, in Isaiah 6, has the angels, the seraphim, covering their eyes in humility, covering their faces, excuse me. Who could get the 24 elders of Revelation 10 to be able to bow down and cast their crowns before his throne. That's a God whom we may want to pay attention to. A God who can grill Job like a steak with dozens of questions about creation, asking even the most faithful of his children, where were you when the world was created? And dozens and dozens of versions after that. This is a God we may want to take seriously about what he says and what he commands. As just a nickel's worth of free advice, take it or leave it. Reason number two to answer the why. Out of, we couldn't do anything without God. God's part of the salvation story wasn't an add-on wasn't an update, wasn't a service pack, wasn't a nice little enhancement to be able to add to our blessed lives. It wasn't that we could choose to have God boost our salvation quotient or not. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, but because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, in sin. I highlight that word dead because it's not sick, it's not injured, it's dead in our transgressions. 
I don't know about you, but I've never seen a dead person better their situation in anything. And that's how we were without Christ. It says in Moses says in verse 21, He is your praise, God. He is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Contextually, Israel wasn't doing anything to better themselves out of getting out of the land of Egypt. Israel probably wouldn't have succeeded if they had tried. But probably would have gone from the slavery they, the slavery they were in to making their own verse to who knows what else Pharaoh would have done had not the plagues and Moses eventually gotten them out of there. Likewise, we aren't going to get out of the depth of our transgressions or our sins on our own, no matter what we do. The fact that God has a plan for our salvation, that's one of the great and awesome things that he has done for us, that our own eyes have seen. The fact that God executes the plan while we are dead in our sin, unable to do anything of it for ourselves, well, that's reason enough to pay attention to what God commands and wants from us. Reason three in answer of the why question. Well, remember how I said that the greatest commandment, quote, wasn't from Jesus? And that particular reference to it in Luke 10. Well, it comes from a man who later asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus says there was a man who was going from Jericho to Jerusalem. And he fell upon robbers and was beaten, stripped, and left half dead on the ditch somewhere. And it just so happens there was a priest who was journeying by. And when he saw the man half beaten in the ditch, he went to the other side of the road and just walked on past. Likewise, a Levite saw the man in the ditch, in need, half dead, and he also, the one you would expect to be able to help, also a priest, went to the other side of the road and walked on by. And the third man came by, the Samaritan, the one you wouldn't have expected to help out a man half dead in, in the ditch. And he saw him and he had compassion on him, bound up his wounds, wounds poured oil and wine on him, put him on his own animal, and took him to the innkeeper. He said, take care of this man. And the next day he brought two deniri to the innkeeper and said, take care of this man while I go take care of business. Whatever else you may charge to bring him back to health, let me know and I'll cover it. And Jesus asked this man who asked, who is my neighbor? Which one sounded like the most of a neighbor. According to the world, Christians belong all right. We have a place to fill our need for belonging, according to Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. But it may not be with the one you think. Is it with the priest that we belong with that part of the story? Is it with the Levite who also, like the priest, walked away? Well, those may be the Christianity 101 questions. No. Here's where it gets a little trickier, though. Does the world say we belong with the Good Samaritan, the one who unexpectedly helps out, leaves the two denarii for the innkeeper to take care of this man he doesn't know? Well, we like to think that we're included with that one, and maybe we are, but according to the world, I would say we're side by side, belonging with the one who got robbed, stripped, left beaten, half dead in a ditch. 
He's not making anybody's A-list, certainly not in that condition, neither is Christianity. The world's not going to take us as Christians and put us on the A-list, give us the red carpet of the Oscars treatment. He could get left for dead for all the world cares, and apparently the priest and the Levite too. Same with Christianity. The world can say, you know what, Christianity can just die in a ditch somewhere and I really won't care. I didn't even plan it, Sally, but your wheels hits pretty good to this point. About how this nation created under God, one nation under God. And the under God part in God we trust just sort of gets left half dead in a ditch somewhere. And the world just walks on by. Fortunately, it's not the end of the story. The Lord is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them with food and clothing. The orphan, the widow, and the strangers being the Jewish version of those left half, those left half dead in a ditch. The alien, the fatherless, the widow. The people who are hopeless. And what does God do? Executes justice for them, loves them, provides them food and clothing. Our God is a God of the robbery victim. A God who acts on his behalf. Who acts on our behalf. The God who executes justice for us, loves us, provides us with food and clothing, just as those particular examples. When God says, you also shall love your, the stranger, we may want to pay attention. Because to the world, we might as well be the stranger. God knows what it's like not to make the world's A-list. God was hung on a tree like a common criminal, like a C-lister. When it feels like the world is tossing you to its fringes, remember that God knows. And in that moment, he is your God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your power. Thank you for your might. Thank you for the awesome things you do. And that you are willing to do them for the alien, the fatherless, the widow, the sea lister. May we always be mindful of that. That it is only because of you that blessings come, not because of anything we can do. As according to the world, we might as well just be left dead in a ditch. But in that moment, you are our God. Amen.